Yes. Um, hello, everyone. Um, uh, we're now going to do something completely different, and it's really because um, it's the last micro presentation of the year, so I thought I would do something um, rather fun where we can all play disease detective, so you can all put your deer stalkers on and we can um, sit back and just listen to what I have to say and then decide what you think is the cause. And this is because we're going to be talking about the English sweating sickness, also known as stoop knave and know thy master. Now, I'm certainly not a medical historian, um, but the business of making retrospective diagnoses, especially historical ones, is actually quite a controversial um, issue I discovered. Um, and this is because even now, um, where we have a biological framework um, for disease, there's still a part of the, the aspect of a disease that is um, a social construct. And so making historical diagnoses, it's quite important um, to bear in mind the, so the contemporary socio-cultural and political context um, in which the, um, the doctors were working. Also, that the sources used to make um, modern diagnoses of an historical disease may actually be quite unreliable, which I think you can gather. But now to mitigate against some of those, um, Mitchell wrote a paper in which he, 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 he listed a, a few um, aspects of, of a text that might um, um, improve the reliability of a retrospective diagnosis, and, and they're listed here. And one of them is an eyewitness testimony and a clear description of symptoms and signs of disease. Um, and I think perhaps that um, this particular treatise or book um, probably ticks a lot of those boxes. And this is because this is, was written by John Keyes in 1552. And it is a book or counsel against the disease commonly called the sweat or the sweating sickness, um, in which he describes the disease. And it was the first of its, of, of, uh, it was the first treatise written in English um, describing one particular disease. Now, there were five epidemics of the sweating sickness starting in 1485 and ending in 1551. And it's the 1551 epidemic that John Keyes observed in Shrewsbury in England that he um, wrote about in, in, in his book. So now who was John Keyes and what was his understanding of medicine? And so what I'm going to do now is just very briefly um, go through how he would have understood medicine um, in that time. Well, he was born in 1510 and 1510 is um, quite an interesting year because according to historians, it was the year of the first influenza pandemic. It was also the year where first Christmas tree was described as well as a pocket watch was used. But, um, um, John Keyes himself um, studied at Cambridge University and that was what was then Gonville College, but he broke off his studies to go to Italy to study at Padua. Now Padua was the university of the day, um, and this was predominantly because in the late medieval time and in the this was the time of the late medieval and the early renaissance there was a revival of learning which which was centered initially around italy and they taught their curriculum of what was called human and what one might call now humanist medicine and this was a movement in medicine which sought to return to the original sources um, of disease and what i mean by original sources i mean original texts so they went back to the Greek of the Hippocratic Corpus and of um, Gay and, and the, the Latin and Greek of Galen um, um, and avoided translations in order to get rid of all the extraneous stuff that may have been added um, in the interim. And they stressed and looked particularly at the humoral theory of Hippocrates and Galen, as well as more contemporarily the importance of anatomy, as well as observation in medicine and not just book learning. And what he did was he brought these ideas back to England, where he sought to um, incorporate them not only in, at Cambridge, where he was for a while, but also at the College of Physicians, which later became the Royal College of Physicians in London. So just quickly, what was the humoral theory? I'm sure you all have some idea of that. 
Well, it was written about in the Hippocratic Corpus. Now, Hippocrates himself um, was a, an, an almost legendary figure, but the Hippocratic Corpus is about 60 books written by various people in which the theories were built up um, over time. And um, this is a final um, version, as perhaps Galen and the medievals might have known of the humoral theory of medicine. And basically, it consists of the idea that contained within the skin, there are key fluids which contain different life sustaining properties. And these are blood, which adds to vitality, cola or yellow bowel, which is your gastric juice, phlegm, which is a lubricant or a coolant, it's basically any clear fluid, and then melancholy or black bile, um, which is a dark fluid, not often seen on its own, but it's responsible for darkening other fluids. So something like melina would be a case of um, melancholy. Now, it was an appealing system because it was quite a holistic system. It could account for physical existence, for example, one's body temperature, the color of one's skin, the physical appearance, as well as one's psychological disposition as well. And we still these days speak of people as being melancholy. And now what caused disease? Well, either an excess or deficiency in the humors um, was responsible for disease, which could either be internal or it could be external caused by things like bad air or mias miasm. Um, and this imbalance could be corrected by diet and lifestyle, which was quite big with um, um, the Hippocratics, or medicine, or surgery as a last resort. And it was also very helpful because it explained what was going on internally in terms of the external. And so that's why um, I think it took up in medicine and doctors could use it. But who was Galen? Because he was also very prominent. Well, he was a medical practitioner in the first um, century of the Common Era in Rome. Um, and he really was quite prolific and systematized Hippocratic medicine and made quite a few contributions of his own, and principally in the area of anatomy and physiology. Now, the, he could not dissect humans because at that time, human dissection, humans were still considered, even if you were a slave, um, a bit too sacrosanct to uh, dissect. So he performed dissections and vivisections on animals. Um, and, and, and describe quite a bit of anatomy that way, especially the neural system and the brain and the nerves. Um, but he also made contributions towards physiology. Um, he, like I said, systematized the four humors, but then also, for instance, started describing the rudiments of the cardiopulmonary system and, and how um, blood works in the body. And this uh, little diagram on the right-hand side sort of shows this, where um, food is taken in, if you start at the bottom, food is taken in um, from the intestines and moves via the portal vein to the liver in, as a substance called chyle, where in the liver it is made into blood. So it's concocted into blood, which goes to the right hand side of the heart. A small amount goes off to the lungs which is returned by um, the pulmonary vein to a, a small pulmonary vein to the um, le left hand side of the heart. But the majority of blood gets from the right hand side of the heart to the left hand side of the heart, according to Galen, through some little pores in the septum of the heart. This blood in the heart is then distributed up to the brain where it is distributed round to the rest of the body where it is used up. So it didn't circulate. That came much later with um, William Harvey. He also said that in each particular organ, like in the liver, like in the heart and in the brain, um, the, the blood was infused with various spirits or pneuma, which again added to, um, um, to the life-giving forces um, of, the, of, of blood um, in the body. And who was Vesalius? Because he was the third big influence on John Keyes. Well, Vesalius, he was a contemporary of John Keyes at Padua, and they actually, he taught him. And he was really the founder of anatomy as we know it. Um, and his famous book, I'm sure you've all seen pictures of De Fabrica Corporis Humani, and he wrote seven books. Um, 
And although um, not startling, this, you know, I mean, it was startling discoveries in terms of what was inside the human body, but people always had a conception of what was inside the human body, especially since the um, Alexandrian um, um, dissectionists. But his theory really challenged um, certain dogmas of the day and bred a new climate of inquiry into medicine. And in fact, John Keyes got it so that that there could be four dissections performed per year by the College of Physicians. Um, he got a dispensation from the Queen um, so that this could be allowed and be taught to prospective doctors. So these were the main influences on his um, medicine. But now what about the social context of the sweating sickness? Well, what was rural England like at this time? Well, especially at the time of the first epidemic, about 90% of the population lived in villages or in the countryside where most were actually agricultural workers. And, and, and I mean, much like today in certain parts, in, in a lot of parts of the world, people lived in crowded houses with entire families living in one or a few rooms, and they had very close contact with their livestock. However, towards the later part of, 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 of the, by the time of the fifth epidemics and towards the latter part uh, um, of the, the centuries, um, there was a so-called occupational shift. And this was really due to the devastating demographic effects of the plague. And the surf labor disappeared. And so landowners who were pretty uh, uh, strapped for cash had to convert their holdings into sheep pasture. And there was major deforestation and marsh drainage. And um, the marsh drainage, I think, must have done wonders for the malaria that was in England, um, but certainly brought um, the environment and man into closer contact. Also, there was quite a lot of social unrest. There was quite a lot of inflation and therefore un and, and unemployment and therefore poverty. And a lot of the youth migrated to the cities. And one of those cities that they went to was especially London. Now, Tudor London initially was quite a small place. However, after the dissolution of the religious houses by Henry VIII, um, there was a rapid increase in the demographics and um, in the econ and, in, and in the economy. Um, in 1500, they estimate that London had a population of about 50,000, whereas in 1600, that population, both in intramural London as well as in the spreading suburbs, had increased almost fourfold. Um, buildings that once belonged to the clergy were um, requisitioned and actually by a lot of um, landlords changed into low-grade housing for these new arrivals, the young single males from the country. And as London grew, so slums developed, and along with the slums came disease. And just to give you some idea of what an average um, London household may have um, looked like, um, we get an idea from Erasmus, who was one of also one of the great scholars and writers of the time. Um, and I doubt he probably frequented um, poorer houses. These are probably the houses of the rich he's talking about, where he, he, he moans that they're not constructed so that a through draft is possible. They are clay floors on which there are rushes, but those rushes are not renewed for for about 20 years. And he says, spittle, vomit, dog's urine, and men's too, dregs of beer, cast off bits of fish, and other unspeakable kinds of filth were present. And so that gives you an idea what Tudor London was like and why it was such a hotbed um, of disease. But just a quick digression, I want to take you to this um, picture in the top corner here. Um, because this is obviously quite an Anglo-centric um, for out of necessity presentation, I thought to try and bring a little bit of Africa into it. And in the middle here, you can see um, an African man um, amongst the other trumpet blowers. And this is actually depicted in the um, Westminster Rolls. Now, this guy was actually called John Blank. And he, he's a real person, and he came across, they think, with the, along with the retinue of Catherine of Aragon, um, and worked for Henry VIII as a trumpeter. And um, he was not a slave, he was a free man in Tudor London, and was in fact sort of so confident and, clo and in close proximity to the king that he even petitioned him for a pay rise at one particular point. 
So what now about the sweating sickness, also called pseudo-Anglicus, because it was known mainly amongst the English. Um, it wasn't actually seen so much in Scotland and in Ireland, although there were some epidemics reported. I said there were five epidemics between 1485 and 1551, and they occurred quite sporadically with various um, numbers of years in between them. But the first one happened at about the time of the Battle of Bosworth Field, where it was occurred in the Welsh marshes and then rapidly spread to London and beyond. Now, the first main eyewitness that we have of this is Thomas Le Forestier, who was a doctor, a French doctor, traveled with the army, and he wrote um, about the disease in London, said it killed as many as 15,000 people. Uh, now, this is a likely exaggeration, but with, as in all new epidemics, it spread panic. And just to let you know that this was a, a, an, an illness that was different from anything that was known by um, the people of the time, they said a new kind of sickness came through the whole region that was so sore, so painful and sharp that the like was never heard of by any man's remembrance before that time. And John Keyes himself said they chanced the disease amongst the people lasting the rest of the month and all September with sudden sharpness and unwanted cruelness passing the pestilence. So what about the epidemiology, if you will, and why was it one of the names Stoop Naven Know Thy Master? And that was because in the first epidemic, it was thought that this mainly occurred amongst the wealthy young aristocrats of the time. And quite a few of them did actually get sick and die. But this is probably just because um, it's, it's almost like a little bit of reporting bias in medieval times because it has shown not to be um, so. And Keyes writes that it was either men of wealth, ease and welfare, or he talks about the poorer sorts, such as were idle persons, good ale drinkers, or tavern haunters. And as you can see at the bottom, he's not quite a tavern haunter, but he is certainly a naughty monk um, stealing the ale that they seem to be brewing. And in fact, in the early um, uh, in the early epidemics, the clergy, before the, the, the dissolution of the monastery, the clergy were hit um, quite badly by the sweating sickness. But in 1538, they introduced parish registers, which recorded deaths, marriages, births. And um, people have made studies of these in order to try and understand the sweating sickness a bit more. And Dyer notes that looking at burials, he says they were quite distinctive in their brevity and intensity. In other words, you've got these 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 um, um, uh, sort of patches of, of um, burials that, um, that um, happened quite quickly and in quite a short space of time in any given village or place. And these were of men, women, and children. And often there were multiple mortalities within family, families, and it was both the rich and the poor. As to its transmission, I mean, obviously we can only guess, but could it have been something vector-borne because of the change in the agrarian practices, or was it perhaps human to human because of um, how you got, for instance, multiple mortalities in the same family? What is also noted is that the epidemics were quite widely scattered, but they were more prominent in the rural areas than in the towns, and it was essentially a summer disease. Um, July, August, September, and then abruptly disappearing um, in winter. And as for the demographic effects and mortality, well, obviously we can't know um, the exact figures, but Keyes said if half of every town escaped, it was thought a great favor. Um, however, it did not impact on the demographics overall, like the plague had done. And what has also been found subsequently by historians, um, looking at both parish registers and testamentary evidence is that there were epidemics between the major epidemics as well. 
So what were the clinical features of the sweating sickness? Well, in the first epidemic, Lafarostia comments mostly on the cardiopulmonary aspects of it, talking about loathsome vapors in the region of the heart and the lungs, where panting of the breath magnifies and increases and eventually restricts itself. But Keyes talks about what he calls tokens of disease or the signs and symptoms of disease. And he says it begins with a pain in the back or the shoulders and the extreme parts, also with abdominal pain and a headache, as well as some madness of the same, which we can presume is some sort of delirium as well and a, a tachycardia. And that's how it starts. And it goes on with and it goes on for a fever to develop, for a sweat, vomiting, diarrhea, which are fluxes, bleedings, but he doesn't um, say exactly when or where um, the bleeding um, was. Um, but he does also speak about the breath, saying how um, the patients were unmercifully, cho uh, unmercifully choked. Um, and then ultimately it ended with a marvelous heaviness and a desire to sleep. Um, so it sounds like patients were sort of slipping into a coma. And so what about the time period? Well, it really, um, the illness rate, ra the range was from a few to 24 hours. Some had killed immediately, and they say those that merrily dined gave sorrowful supper, but that the maximum time was about 24 hours. And that fever was a constant. Um, it wasn't only the sweating. And he says, and this is because Key says, this disease is not a sweat only, but really a fever. And it seems that a crisis point was reached where you would get profuse sweating, although that sweating would be of a short duration or a short abiding. If the patient survived 24 hours, they were generally thought to survive the illness. And one of the survivors was... Um, Anne Berlin, who you see in the top corner there, except Henry didn't stay by her, this was when he still liked her, um, didn't stay by her bedside, but was actually 12 miles hence, um, so as not to catch it himself. So we still are no closer to um, knowing what the sweating sickness was, although it certainly sounds like there was a viral, certainly sounds viral in the sense that there was a prodrome and then um, other signs and symptoms. Um, but it was certainly very rapid and rapidly, probably quite rapidly fatal. So what are some of the theories? Well, just before we get onto it, I'll just tell you what some other people have theorized. Um, Thwaites goes on to say how he thinks it was hunter virus pulmonary syndrome, and he based this mainly on the symptoms and the seasonality. Other people have said it was an arbovirus infection, again, the season, again, based on symptoms, seasonality, and the agrarian practices, the change in the landscape at the time. And Carlson and Hammond have actually gone on so far as to say it was CCHF, and that the bleedings just couldn't be seen because the treatment prescribed, um, and it was prescribed also by the likes of Keys, was to lie in bed covered up um, so that you could sweat, although to, to balance your humors again, although sweat but not too much, but sweat not too little either. And he said, because probably physicians only took the pulse, um, you couldn't see any of the hemorrhagic manifestations. Some people have thought of it as just merely an enterovirus, or others, and it's quite an influential, and in fact, a lot of people have thought that it was possibly influenza. So I thought now I'd open the floor and see what everyone else thinks as possible diagnoses. Um, and I think as long as you don't tell me it was the king's evil or something like that, I think we'll, we'll, um, we can have quite a nice discussion as to what caused the sweating sickness. So thanks. Lovely, Elizabeth. Thank you. What a what a treat. Um, that's a, a, a beautiful presentation. So, well, the floor is open. Obviously, I mean, it's interesting that Henry VIII was very good at social distancing at times of disease and very bad at social distancing when he wanted a new wife. So, <laughs> it's fun. Um, perhaps you could um, stop sharing your screen and we can. We can take comments. I mean, obviously, uh, when we have cases like this, the first our first port of call. And if colleagues can put their um, 
put their uh, videos on when they speak. Uh, I mean, we do generally open it up to our um, our, our uh, junior doctors. So, um, Tari, are you on the call? Um, if not, I'm here, Prof. So I'm here. here. All right. Okay. So, Tari, over to you. What um, What do you think? Sure. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure, Prof. I mean, I guess it could be um the, uh, the the stuff that we're discussing now and i guess tb is also on the cards as well tb then, why do you think tb okay maybe what, I'm, would you have, what test would you have done for tb in 1540 whatever gosh i don't think there was a test for tb back then okay um so, Sean, I think uh, you're the next one up. You wanted to uh, offer a diagnosis. Oh, well, I mean, look, I think all the ones, let me turn on my video. I think all the ones suggested make a lot of sense and are pretty good. Um, I, I was just thinking of leptospirosis as one that hasn't been mentioned. Um, although, I mean, it sounds like re relatively acute, um, dominated by very high fever. Um, but I mean, all of the other symptoms could be compatible, um, all of the other manifestations. Um, and then it said, Elizabeth, in your second to last slide, typhus was, seems to have been kind of excluded. Um, well, I, want, I was just wondering why that is. I mean, you can imagine the typhus could also present similarly. Okay, over to Elizabeth in a minute. What about malaria, um, Elizabeth? On mute. Elizabeth. Sorry, malaria people um, did think of, um, although pre if, uh, predominantly in England at the time, there was a bit of falciparum, but it was predominantly vivax. So they'd get what they called the ague, um, where they'd get a more prolonged um, course, even, um, which, which this disease didn't seem to have. Okay. Um I'm going to move on to the sort of uh, to Stephen Corsman, who um, I also know has a, a great interest in history of medicine. Stephen, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I have no idea really. Um, if you look at the epidemiology of antiviruses, it's entirely possible. Europe was somewhat warmer back then, I think. Um, so you could have a whole range of different vectors happening or different vectors endemic transmitting various viruses. It's difficult. I, I don't think I believe the Congo um, theory, but hint is a possibility. Stephen, what about hepatitis E? Um, no, I think they've traced, I, I think they've calculated the um, most recent common ancestor of the pig-related hepatitis E to be more recent than this. Um, the originating virus from bats would have been older than this, but or approximately the same time, but I think it would be a bit of a stretch. Um, Elizabeth, can I ask you, were, were animals ever affected? Um, not that any of the records show. You mean like plague and the rat fall? Um, it, it, I couldn't find anything um, in my readings about um, animals being affected, no. Okay, because I mean also in the UK, well in, in England at that time, as now, there, there's Lauping Ill, which is um, oh. a, a tick-borne um, infection, often in sheep, and they start to laup. L-O-U-P, which um, means they sort of almost fit like a springbok, I think. Um, okay. and it's a febrile illness and humans can be, be infected in outbreaks, but you tend to see it in, the, um, in, in animals as well, I'm guessing. Um, okay. Well, I mean, it's obvious that, that Eunice, um, in KZN, Eunice, you have the answer for us, so perhaps you'd like to, to share it. I have the faintest idea. Very interesting. Thank you very much. Got us all thinking. Well, it's clearly a disease that's characterized by fever. It's characterized by a rapid onset of mortality. 
uh, I think there was some sense that there was a respiratory symptoms. Am I, am I, did I get that right? Yes. yes. Yeah, so um, I, I like the virus, the viral illnesses, because the viral illnesses will fit in with something that's spread quite rapidly between people. Oh, that's the other thing. We need this infection to be spread from person to person. Doesn't seem to be any other, either from person to person through a vector or person to person directly. And viruses seem to fit all of those rather than bacterial or parasitic. So I can't add more to what viruses one would consider, but um, it does certainly sound viral. Thank you. Thank you, Nissa. And as Sean has said, what we're all thinking, of course, I mean, really the only two possibilities are uh, traditionally TB or COVID. Um, could this have been the first outbreak of COVID? And we just had a, we just haven't recognized it. Probably not. The last, um, I mean, Elizabeth, uh, before we just, because we're at the top of the hour, I mean, would you like to pick somebody who hasn't made um, an input to give us the last uh, last idea? Um, I don't know. Perhaps um, Prof Brink would like to tell us what he thinks <laughs> about it. Always, always somebody with the answer, Prof Brink. Yeah. You are muted, Professor Brink. The world awaits your view. Well, in, if it's not a virus, then I think it's a carbapenem resistant enterobacterialis. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, an excellent interjection. Um, thank you, uh, uh, Elizabeth. As I said, a, a real treat. Um, I was hoping that you were going to give the entire presentation in Old English, because I think that would have been uh, even more entertaining. But um, I think we should next year go down a little bit more down the history of medicine. Um, rabbit hole and do similar things. It's a wonderful, a wonderful um, meeting to have and a presentation, so thank you. Um, as I said, I'm not sure whether we're going to um, have a, a, another meeting next week. There's a lot of different things depending. Um, if we are, probably be something fun again, maybe a quiz. But um, if not, uh, I hope everybody stays safe over the over the coming period, and uh, that you get to um, that you get to spend time with your families and uh, enjoy um, a little bit of life, and uh, hopefully this fourth wave will uh, be kinder to us. So, if we meet again uh, next week, fantastic. If not, we'll meet again in the new year. And thank you um, ahead of time to everybody who's presented and everybody who's you know, given input to our microbiology and, and ID. Um, together. Fabulous meetings, always learn an awful lot and uh, really appreciate your time. Thanks very much. Take care everybody. <laughs>